Hello, and welcome to episode four of the God Cells podcast. I'm Eric Marola. I've spent the last decade reporting on various scientific innovations within the world of medicine. For those hearing my voice for the first time today and know nothing about me, you can check me out at ericmarola.com. That's E-R-I-C-M-E-R-O-L-A.com. The subject of this podcast series is fetal stem cells for which I have concluded after four years of reporting on this technology to be one of the most innovative scientific medical breakthroughs humanity has yet to embark upon. So much so that if fetal stem cell therapy was left unobstructed to thrive in today's market, it would do nothing less than change the face of medicine. I have not only been investigating fetal stem cells as a journalist, but I am also a participant. I have received this therapy myself annually since 2016, with my fourth annual treatment last month in April of 2019. Since the release of the God Cells, I've found great pleasure in communicating with those who decided to go to M-Cell after having seen my documentary. Why M-Cell? Because they are the world's leading pioneers of this technology and the only institution on earth doing this work at this caliber. Don't be fooled, there are a lot of wannabes out there. M-Cell is the only place to go. My guest today is John Holliday, who watched The God Cells and decided to give M-Cell a go. I think our conversation speaks for itself. Hello, John. Hey, Eric. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Yeah? be better. Glad to hear it. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. This just changed everything for me. Tell me more. I mean, I mean, we, you know, we had been in communication for a while before, you know, you went and then, you know, we met each other and I saw you and, you know, you had difficulty getting around and, um, you know, we spoke a little bit. You had your friend Vladimir there. He's, he's a physician yeah. as well, correct? Yeah, he's a surgeon. Okay. In Moscow. Wow. So I have a degenerative back uh, issue for about the last 20 years and real painful and uh, got to the point where I couldn't really walk and I got spinal surgery in 2013 and that helped for a while although the pain never went away and then I had a second spinal surgery uh, at the end of November 2018 uh, there was some nerve damage on the spinal cord during the surgery and as soon as I came out of the anesthesia I realized I didn't have any feeling with either one of my legs I was numb Okay. but I was able to walk I was in a lot of pain but I was able to walk again after that surgery and then about two or three weeks post surgery I went to get up one day and my legs just gave out on me and uh, just overnight I had lost all of the strength in my legs and over the next uh, probably 48 hours I became paralyzed in my left leg, I couldn't even lift my leg off the bed or anything. Um, went back in the hospital. They did all kinds of tests. Uh, couldn't figure out what it was. Um, said it was probably something called Guillain-Barré syndrome, which is a demyelinating nerve issue, um, which is actually fatal in many cases. Oh wow! The Paralysis receded over the next two and a half or three months until I could walk again. But I was very weak and I had a lot of trouble like going up and down stairs, um, still in a lot of pain, and couldn't walk more than about 50 or 100 feet before I'd have to stop and rest for a bit before I could get up. And it just was really, my quality of life went to hell. Over the last few years, I've had to avoid going to places like Target or Walmart because I just couldn't walk that far in the store. Wow. And we progressed. I was in a walker for a while and then a cane. And uh, By the time I ran into your uh, your documentary, The God Cell, I thought, oh, man, i got to try it. There's got to be something because I'd been to all the doctors, neurologists and Reno and Minneapolis, and nobody could do anything for me. They all said, well, you're just going to have to learn to live with it and you'll end up being in a wheelchair. That's that, you know. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to accept that. So I scraped up the money. I went to the Ukraine with you to M-Cell. And 
the results were so astounding, amazing. I started the therapy on Monday morning. And on Wednesday, the third day, when I was at the clinic, when I was getting the massage, I realized I had feeling in my legs again. It wasn't completely back, but I could feel the, the Seuss's hands. Mm -hmm. And over the last 20 years, I graduated up through every narcotic painkiller known to oxymorphone, morphine, sulfate, and everything else. Nothing really worked anymore. Literally, by the third day, on Wednesday, by the time I left the clinic, I was completely out of pain. I haven't taken a single painkiller since I left Ukraine. Wow. So now it's a month later, and at this point, I'm walking better than I have in 30 years. There's no pain at all. I walked on Wednesday, on the third day of the treatment, I probably walked, I don't know, a mile or a mile and a half. That was the furthest I'd been able to walk in probably five or six years. And I don't know what I'm up to today, but it wouldn't surprise me if I'm doing seven or eight miles a day with no problem. Yeah. That's amazing. That's really, really well, exciting. Right now, I'm to the point where I, I, I haven't walked this well in 20 years. That's amazing. And, oh, <laughs> Yeah, gave me my life back. Oh, John, this is like, like I said in the email. Um, this is why I keep doing this is to you know see these stories. What are tell me about some of the people around you? I'm kind of curious. What's kind of fun about these kinds of uh, results is seeing the people that love you around you uh, witness it. Like, I'd love to hear what you're seeing from your friends and family at all. Yeah, everybody I see says, "What did you do?" You know, <laughs> well, one of the problems I'd had is uh, as this spinal uh, condition worsened, I was bent forward. I couldn't straighten up at all. Mm -hmm. And that this has been, I don't know, maybe the last four years or so, I haven't been able to stand straight. That's no longer an issue. I stand up straight, walk fine, and have, you know, the normal aches and pains and arthritis from high mileage, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had a little bit of arthritis in my knees and my hips and my hands. That's gone. Mm -hmm. I don't have any pain in any joint anymore. Yep. And that's just amazing. Yeah, I'm only especially, 40s. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, especially if it was a wet or a cold day, my hands would be so sore. I'd have a hard time holding a pencil or anything like that. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just not an issue anymore. That's wonderful. Yeah, you know, just last night I was walking because I, I got my annual treatment the same week you did, and I'd had yeah. it you know a few times before that. But um, it's I just was walking to the farmers market last night. We walked um, to the ocean, and uh, just even though I'm only 46, and I know you're 63, but you know even in your 40s you sort of begin to feel those kinds of things. And I just was like, I can't believe how I have no no soreness anywhere. It's phenomenal. Anyway, so I, I can relate, except not you know the same as you, because you've been through a lot more than me, of course. But um, yeah, it's funny you ended the. If you don't mind talking about it, you ended the email, which is always a fun part of this therapy for me. Aside from what's really more important is uh, libido. <laughs> tell me. <laughs> well, I tell you, it's like I'm 20 again. I know. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, probably, probably part of that is because I'm not on the drugs anymore, but just my energy level is incredible i enjoy getting up and going to work in the morning again i i can think clearly it seems yeah, yeah. you know mm -hmm. cognitive function has improved mm -hmm. so that was the best thing i ever did i I'm, definitely am gonna go back for a second treatment when i can yeah i mean i'll be going back the same time every year myself just because i as you know i do it for preventative and i also just really enjoy the quality of life improvements overall the cognitive stuff. I mean, especially under times of stress, um, if you're not thinking clearly and stress is coming at you, it's really frustrating. And that's one of the things I love about this is just how crystal clear my brain has become. Um, not that it was too foggy, but it's just, it was a huge improvement. You know, I, I totally, you know, agree. now that you mentioned stress, that's interesting. I hadn't really picked up on that, but <laughs> I haven't been stressed about anything. Yeah. <clears throat> There's that too. Like we all are, have different personalities, but you know, we all, at times of weakness, we can let the littlest things stress us out. And I don't do that yeah. anymore since I've been doing this. But in times when, when serious things in life occur that involves yeah. you can't avoid that they're really heavy things to deal with in life, I've never dealt with them so efficiently um, as I have with this therapy. So, but no, it's good to hear. Um, how about like, how was your sleep before this versus now? 
I sleep pretty well now, that's yeah. for sure. I, I hadn't really considered that. I think I was sleeping pretty poorly before, just because I could never get into a comfortable position. Uh, I'm assuming your pain scale before the therapy, let's just... Is it safe to call it a an eight to a ten? Would you say? Yes. Okay. Yes. And what would you, if you had to yeah. scale it? What would you call it now? One. Wow, that's awesome. You know, uh, since I was in Ukraine, which is a month now, one mm-hmm. month ago, mm-hmm. one month yesterday, I left. Uh, I've had maybe one or two uh, slightly painful days, but really nothing. You know. Not enough to. I took. I think I took an ibuprofen one time. Sure. But that's nothing, you know. I learned to live with the pain over the years, and uh, I, I was, I'm kind of stubborn, and so <laughs> I just wouldn't allow myself to to ride around in a wheelchair. Right. You know, because to me it felt like that was giving up, like I like I was accepting it. So I I tried everything that I could think of, you know, over the years. I don't know how many doctors I've seen. None of them ever seem to be able to come up with a real diagnosis. They give it a definition. They say demyelinating polyneuropathy. Mm-hmm. But that's not a diagnosis. That's just a description. Mm-hmm. That's, that's you know, nerve damage, right? Right. And I uh, spoke with one of the top neurologists in Nevada about it just before I went to MCEL. And he said, well, under the best of conditions, you can expect uh, that if the nerves are going to grow back, they don't grow more than an inch a month. And so I was looking at if everything was perfect, it'd be three or four years before I had nerves down to the end of my legs again. Mm-hmm. And here it is, what, 30 days later. Right. <laughs> right. I haven't tried jogging yet, but I swear I could. I could go outside right now and jog. That's amazing. I mean, because I really remember we were, you know, as you know, with the therapy there, you get moved from room to room. And I think I saw you coming out of either one of the rooms. I don't know. And you were having difficulty walking. And yeah. um, and that's and I, my little bit of time spent with you, like maybe at breakfast, I'd see you in the evenings. <clears throat> but because of your mobility issues, you didn't really venture out that much. So because I would yeah. like walk around with the others and show them various things and uh, cool places to eat. So, um, yeah. I, wow. You live in Nevada? Well, yeah, I split my time between there and uh, Minnesota, okay. Arizona. I, I travel all the time. Which was really difficult for me because, you know, in airports, going from one gate to another, it's always a yeah. two-mile walk, it seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now I don't mind it, you know. Wow, that's awesome. <clears throat> I ask because I obviously want to stay in touch with you. I wouldn't mind even, um, you know, getting some film of you one down the road. But I want to do more of these podcasts. And I, um, you know, I don't have a schedule. I'll do them whenever... I can get someone to do it, you know, as in, as, a, as we are doing today, but a guy named Ben, who's about my age last fall, November went, he fell off a tractor and had been living with hideous back pain forever. He's bedridden half the time just because of the pain. He was addicted to all kinds of painkillers, um, started drinking too much, all those things. But as soon as you know, just like you, a few weeks to a month in, he just cut it all out. He cut all the toxins out of his life. He's never been so happy to be alive. But it worried me at the time for him because he just cut cold turkey, uh, taking all these narcotics for so many years. He's like, well, I don't care. I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> so I guess, yeah. it, are you? did you do the same thing? You just said, forget it. I'm not going to even wean off. I just go on. I'm, take, I'm stopping him. I did. I went cold turkey. Okay. And here's another, here's another interesting thing. I've stopped taking the painkiller several times over the years mm-hmm. because I just don't like it. You know, mm-hmm. I don't like the way it makes me feel and mm-hmm. stuff. And it's always been <laughs> miserable. Right. I can see why it's easier to take drugs than to quit. You know, because right. I'd be sick. I'd be sick for a week, just mm-hmm. feel terrible and not sleep and night sweats and just yeah, you know, going off of the hard narcotics is tough. Mm-hmm. This time, I took the last pill. The last day I was at the clinic there, had no symptoms, nothing. Yeah. None whatsoever. Yeah. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, so I mean, forgive me for being redundant. So you took your last painkiller the third day of therapy and you haven't taken one in a month at all. I have. Yeah. Okay. I have not taken one since then. Yeah. It's amazing because you're not the, like I said, you're not the first one I've heard this. And, um, and I, and the scientists and the doctors at MSA are the first to admit 
the sort of baffling nature of it. And if you ask them, they would say, no, 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 you need to wean off of them like any responsible doctor would, but it's easier sure. said than done. If you've been taking this, you just want it to be rid of them. But there is yeah. something fascinating about this therapy in regards to, um, you know, this almost sort of coming off of addiction. It's really weird. I've, you know, not only as I, have I heard it helps with people just with simple clinical depression, but it's helped people who are trying to, you know, or quit drinking, things like that. I've heard that's, they don't have a protocol for that. It's just, it's just been a weird side effect of it. Of course, the patient wants to have to make these lifestyle changes, like someone who drinks too much, or like in your case, you simply want to stop taking these narcotics that make you miserable. But it, it is interesting that these things also help with that transition without all of these withdrawal symptoms. It's so bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like we, it's like we're getting baby cells. Right. Well, yeah. Gee. <laughs> Babies don't need to drink. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't quite know what to expect, but I'd gotten to the point where I felt I had no other options. I'd exhausted every possible medical procedure that was known in America, and what a novel concept! Medicine that actually addresses the issue instead of just trying to mask the symptoms. Right. Right. It's, a, it's a shame that we have to go halfway around the world to get decent medicine, you know? I agree with you. I'm, I'm fortunate that uh, my friend Vladimir Laudanovic was with me. He's a surgeon, mm -hmm. um, speaks perfect fluent Russian, grew up in Moscow. Mm -hmm. So he stayed there the whole time with me, sort of my on-site translator, so there was never any kind of questions. That's great. And uh, he was there for a very specific reason as well. Uh, his son has a hearing problem, mm -hmm. and there's really no options as far as they know of for treating his son's hearing. And so he wanted to uh, investigate this to see if this was an option for his son. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't know what he's decided on that. I haven't spoken with him since I was there. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, he's... He's a very advanced surgeon that uh, studied all over the world, in Italy and the United States and Spain, and uh, he's currently in Serbia and Belgrade, and his passion is research. Right. And as soon as I had seen the God Cell, I immediately contacted him and I said, you got to watch this. This is, this is something. Either mm -hmm. this is something or this is nothing. You know, what do you think? Right. He's kind of, because I'm a research scientist myself, mm -hmm. you know, I've been in the pharmaceutical field for too many years and run a lot of clinical trials and I was familiar with stem cells but only adult stem cells mm. and I had actually run a clinical trial on adult stem cells for regenerating cartilage in ankles wow. and uh, we had moderate results and think that there's some promise for that mm -hmm. but nothing like fetal stem cells yeah. Now I re now I realize if I'd have been using fetal stem cells for this cartilage regeneration, it would have been an entirely different outcome on that trial. But yeah. between uh, between Vladimir and myself uh, looking into the research on stem cells, I just couldn't find any downside to it. Right. You know, this, uh, it's like it's going to work or it's going to work, but it's not going to harm you is the impression that I came up with after reading every paper and I read them all in English and he read them all in Russian. So <laughs> we kind of covered the, the whole spectrum there. That's great. Yeah. What I tell people that are really on the fence about it or afraid, you know, I say, you know, I'm not, I can't give you advice. I'm not your physician, but I say, you know, the worst that happens is you spend the money and nothing happens. You know, it's not, yeah. you know, and, uh, I'm, you know, so in your case, it's just so exciting to see this. This is awesome. It's really awesome, John. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I thought. You know, it's, it's not the cheapest therapy, but so what? It's yeah. the best money I ever spent. Yeah. And a lot of people I find too that, you know, yeah, cause it is a lot of, that's a good chunk of change all at once, but a lot of people with various issues they've been battling for years, if they add it up all they're out of pocket, it's usually more per year than what they spent to them. So, you know? Oh, yeah. God. yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that one. It yeah. was less than I spend on any given year. Okay. Just on my insurance co-pays and, you know, by the time you pay the deductible and everything else. Yeah. Um, I'm not so certain that Affordable oh. Care Act has given us affordable care. Right. Yeah. That's a whole other can of worms there. <laughs> yeah. 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 I wish that uh, we were more politically open to things like researching fetal stem cells. 
Yeah, as you know, I you mean, know, we, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We, we have the answers. Yeah. You know, mankind has gotten to the point where we have the knowledge and we have the answers and we're being stymied by all kinds of things, you know, religion and, and politics and regulatory agencies. That's a big one yeah. in our country. Where I stand, I'm, like, I'm, you're, you're familiar that I've done like other movies other than this, right? Yes. Um, okay. Because in 10 years of doing these films, um, I've sort of gotten graduated beyond the frustration. I was kind of an activist for a while and thinking I could change it and, you know, the system. And, you know, if people only see this, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, with fetal stem cells, it's sort of the holy grail of, of like... <laughs> The most, you know, the most dangerous thing ever invented by man in regards to medicine. I mean, you have the abortion issue. That's just going to immediately polarize and divide the population out of the gate. And then, yeah. so that's, you've got that. And then, of course, I know I'm telling you things you already know, but, but for me, it's, um, it's just the money part. And, you know, you're, it's such a massive threat to the industry. I mean, I look at my other films, like this one scientist in Houston who simply invented a, a competitor to chemo and radiation. It's not a magic bullet cure, but it's quite effective. And in fact, everybody that went to him and was told they're going to die anyway, and he ends up saving a fair amount of them. And they've been using the regulatory agencies to destroy this man, you know, for gosh, decades. So I just, with fetal, oh my God, I mean, you know, you're talking about cancer is a $4 trillion industry, you know, over the course of a few years. But, you know, you're talking about getting rid of the heart disease industry, the diabetes industry and all the narcotics industries it's just sort of crazy you can pretty much collapse wall street if you let this unleashed you know <laughs> yeah it would reshape the whole financial outlook of the country yeah american medicine and western medicine in general makes their money on sick people yeah yeah and there's no real drive to make them better no you know? no it's just sort of the sad reality it's just you know it's just capitalism it's just you know yeah. you got to fight uh, for your position but what's also interesting too is with fetal, which adds it to the complication deeper. Let's just say hypothetically that M cell was given the green light to say open up a phase one study in the U.S. Let's just say hypothetically, which by the way they're going to be applying for uh, for heart disease, as I mentioned in my lecture. Let's just pretend that there was no regulatory obstruction and they could do it, and then they funded a phase one and a phase two and a phase three trial and they got it approved in the United States, and M cell backed all of that say. Um, and opened up an American company. What would happen is every Joe Schmo biotech company would say, thank you for spending all the money and doing all the work. And they would just become instant competitors because you can't really, it's not a chemical based drug that can be patented. And anyone yeah. can, anyone can patent the processes. Sure. How you harvest, how you store, how you test, how you administer. But that, I mean, good grief, that's such a wide gray area. Anybody can alter it to umph degree and then have their own patent, you know, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, wait, I, I agree with you. I wish we didn't have to travel halfway around the world, but I guess what I'm getting at is I'm, I'm just happy to know that these things are even out there. Um, given, you know, the sort of jungle that we live in, in regards to finding good, really good care. But, uh, yeah. As I, as I project forward, um, my particular field is sterile tissue culture mm -hmm. and, I don't know anything about growing human cells. It's not exactly my field, but it's mm -hmm. very similar. And uh, I think at some point, somebody's going to find a way where they can uh, cultivate the fetal cells. And I know they're claiming to do a lot of that sort of thing in Mexico and whatnot, which I wonder about. But when that happens, then it'll take the abortion... Uh, component right out of this sure yeah and that's that's going to be how this becomes uh, mainstream medicine They're in the west that's i'm glad you brought that up that actually has been trying to happen for a while um it's interesting uh, there's a good and bad of this uh, subject like there's a company called stemetica in san diego that for example mm -hmm. took one uh donor uh fetal brain cell and is and they're again patenting or have patented the processes of 
replicating those cells. So you don't only need mm -hmm. one, uh, say, abortion. Um, so there's many challenges. So you have M cell that gives you close to two dozen, if not more at times, depending on the patient, stem cell types, whether it be liver, <clears throat> lung, brain, you know, all of those types down to the, you know, rep rep reproductive and some people, eye tissue, like you <clears throat> name it. Um, and then, so you, which means you'd have to replicate or create a replication process for each type. So in this case, you have 25 different types uh, for 25 different replications, right? So you have all of that, which is a huge expensive undertaking, which is, doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, but M I've talked to MCEL about this at great length and they disagree. This is just personal scientists disagreeing. They find that man why manipulate them for A, because there's such an abundance of fetuses. There's not any shortage. I mean, there's, yes. we couldn't have the resource. We don't have the resources to harvest them all if we wanted to. They throw away 30 or 40% of the material comes to them for any reason. If it's slightly out of whack, even if they're tested clean. Um, yeah. And then they just feel like when you start to replicate them, it can, it can be into dangerous territory where they could mature beyond their role. Because um, the whole point is to stopping them in time and then administering it to the patient. But I guess going back to your point, though, sure. I mean, maybe one day it'll be such a uh, it'll be mastered to such a degree where it is equal in potency to the actual, you know, harvested one that, you know, that'd be ideal. But again, it goes to the same thing, unfortunately, where you would have a biotech company with deep pockets to be able to replicate yeah. the whole thing. It's not it's not impossible. And of course, it's not impossible. But uh, but well, yeah, only, yeah. The only advantage to it would be the uh, religious and political division over the abortions. Sure, know, sure, sure. That's the advantage that I see. Yeah. And possibly making it a little bit more uh, likely to pass FDA regulatory issues because then it becomes more of a, a biological, they right. call it these days, biological mm -hmm. drug. Mm -hmm. And tissue culture has, uh, has advanced in leaps and bounds over the last 20 years that I've been involved in it. And so I think that one day it will be possible it may be possible today. I don't know enough about human cell replication, but like you say, having them mature beyond that point where they're universe available to people with no. no DNA matching, you know, that's the thing. Right. No, the technology from what I understand is available today. It's just to replicate it is just such an expensive undertaking. doesn't mean it's yeah. not possible. I mean, anything with enough money can be done, but no, the technology is already there. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, NASA was pretty expensive. You know, the first epoxy glue right. they made cost a million dollars a right. gallon. And right. now we buy it at Home Depot. You right, know? exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> sooner sooner or later, humans are going to start, you know, I think, demanding cures and help. Sure. And unfortunately, that's not where the research funds are going today. No. There are a few diseases they look at, you know, can we cure this disease? It's rather, you know, can we come up with a better insulin? Right. Or can we somehow mask this symptom and give the patient a better quality of life? Well, yeah. there's limitations on that, you know? Yeah, essentially, because you're a research scientist, I mean, I, and I've spoken to others that have dealt with, um, like, the sort of, especially in the world of the cancer pipeline, it's usually, you know, designed around, okay, what can we create that somebody would have to take for the rest of their life? <laughs> that's, you know, that's what it's all about, because that's the, where the most, obviously, the most uh, payday is. You know, I, I often joke that if the antibiotic was invented tomorrow morning, it would never make it to market. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I worked as head of uh, mycology research for one of the big pharma companies, and uh, we had developed something that was extremely effective mm -hmm. for cancer. Matter of fact, it's used in about 32 countries today. Mm -hmm. And the approach that this pharmaceutical company took was to increase the cost and reduce the dosage so that it wouldn't cure anybody, mm -hmm. but it would be a lifetime treatment. Yeah. And I, went, I went right to the CEO of the company, president of the company, and I said, this isn't about medicine, this is about money. Right. And he looked me, looked me in the eye and he said, bingo, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah that was my last day working for that company good for you, you. Know, I, had to, yeah. I had to walk away yeah As i mean I see that we've got cures available to us today we've got them yep and yeah they're not going to market 
Yeah. And even if a company, even if your CEO said, you know what, John, you're right. Let's do this the right way. They would just been put out of business. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. yeah so yeah. they would just be putting themselves out of business eventually. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just financial suicide to actually be that innovative in this field. Unfortunately, um, if you want to compete like in America, for example, you know, so, yeah. yeah. Well, there's some advantages to social medicine, I think. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like, at what point does capitalism take over our lives? Speaking from, you know, just from personal perspective, 20 years of not being able to walk. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that sucks, you know? Yeah. So this started in your 40s then? Yeah. Yeah. Probably even earlier than that. But it, it got, I don't know, it got really serious probably about 2007 or 2008. And uh, I just held off and held off and tried to avoid getting surgery until you know, I had to. But now I've been through two surgeries, and here I am a month after M cell. <laughs> Good as new. That's yeah, amazing, really. John. It's just so exciting. <laughs> yeah. Tell you what, it's amazing to me. Like I put in my email to you, you gave me my life back. Wow. That's what I feel like, you know. I just made a movie, like, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> if I hadn't stumbled across that video, I'd still be in a walker probably. So it's a big deal for me. That's yeah. Well, it's a big deal for me too. It, it makes me really, really happy because not everybody, you know, uh, the vast majority of people report really good results, but you know, not everybody yeah. does like a really good friend of mine, his wife, um, she's been dealing with a lot of autoimmune issues that are mysterious and undiagnosed. And she went that same week you were there and she's not, you know, seeing the relief she was hoping for. So, yeah. you know, it's just, I want the listeners to understand this is not a magic bullet, but when it works, it really works, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like any medicine. None of them work for everybody. Right. I always, I always use, you know, penicillin as an example. Right. If you're, if you have a serious case of infectious pneumonia and you take one 500 milligram dose of penicillin, what do you expect? You know, in, in eight hours, you expect to see significant improvement. And the next day, you know, again, significant improvement. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have something that is going to be addressed by that penicillin, if you're perfectly healthy, let's say, and you take penicillin what do you expect mm -hmm. nothing, nothing right will happen. right so you know we don't the truth is we don't know much about medicine i mean we're kind of arrogant to think that we're so smart and uh, one of my neurologist friends said it to me perfect one day he said every day i feel like i'm looking through a straw into an unknown universe you know Mm -hmm. It's like we do our best to try and understand all of these functions and processes in the body, but nature's amazing. You know, these these bodies are so complex, and everything is interrelated. Yep. You know? Yep. You're right. So if if there's something that the stem cells will address, then I recommend everybody try it. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. It is a remarkable concept. You know, once when I dove into this and I realized what they're doing is sort of well. First, it was inspired by what we learned on what what happens during pregnancy, but then just sort of in a way, just recreate that and regardless of gender um, and like supercharged version of that because um, and that's all it is. You know, it's already a natural life cycle that's just being recreated. You know, versus a yeah. foreign chemical being thrown into you. So yeah, no, it's exciting stuff. I, <laughs> Are you suggesting that the pharmaceutical company has <laughs> deceived us? You know, they, they convince us that uh, we require to put things in our body to stay healthy that never existed in the universe until somebody invented it in a test tube. Right. No, I'm not <laughs> suggesting that. I don't know. I don't know what you're you talking know, about. There's something wrong with that concept. Yeah. Everything that's required to keep the body healthy is available from nature, obviously, or we would have gone extinct long ago. You know? Absolutely. Speaking of which, um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about your work uh, in mushrooms, if you would, since we're talking about things found in nature. Um, okay. Yeah, I would love to hear. Uh, I'm sure the people I, listening would love to hear. That. I yeah. founded a company in 1999 called uh, Aloha Medicinals, mm -hmm. and we rapid. And it's a medicinal mushroom company. We rapidly became the largest manufacturer of medicinal mushrooms in the world. Mm -hmm. um, we. The company still exists. I sold out uh, the majority portion about three years ago. But we supply about 700 companies in 65 countries uh, with raw materials for both drugs and supplements. Uh, make a couple of products which are used for cancer all over the world and one that's used for HIV in 18 countries in Africa. And 
a lot of people don't realize that the fungal kingdom, you know, mushrooms, mm -hmm. are probably the largest source of raw materials for drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, all, the, all the antibiotics, uh, all the anti-rejection drugs, uh, all the cholesterol drugs. Yep. You know, people take Lipitor or Crestor, and they don't realize where it comes from. It comes directly out of a mushroom. Right. It comes from the oyster mushroom. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that a, a pharmaceutical company, in order to patent it, will take that natural compound, in the case of Lipitor or Crestor, for example, that compound is called Lovostatin. And the pharmaceutical company will take it and they'll throw a little molecular twist on it. Mm -hmm. They'll put a methyl group here or an oxygen there. Well, what happens when we manipulate a natural molecule is it always becomes more toxic. Mm -hmm. You see, because nature has evolved the least toxic form of that compound, obviously, because it's in a living thing. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's in a mushroom. And if we throw an extra oxygen on it, it may make it patentable, but it always increases the toxicity without exception, which means side effects. Right. Yeah. So they do that for economic reasons. Sure. Keep it patented. Yeah. Or many drugs, when nature makes it, you have two forms of it. Essentially, it's like your left hand and your right hand. And a lot of drugs that are made... Uh, both the left hand and the right hand will be equally effective in the body. It's not true with all of them, but many of them. Mm -hmm. So like some of the uh, acid reducers that you take, you know, Prilosec, these kinds. So what the companies will do now is they'll start out with the patent on both the left and right hand mixed together, called a racemic mixture. And then when the patent runs out on that, then they'll patent just the left-hand molecule. But when that one runs out, they can patent just the right-hand molecule. Same drug. Right. Same exact drug. Right. But in that way, they're able to get three patents out of it right. sequentially so they can keep it under patent for a long period of time. So there's a lot of dirty laundry in the pharma industry. Sure. The way clinical trials are run, the way clinical trials are reported. Yeah. That's a big one. Yeah. Report the good results and and cover the rest up. Yeah, yeah, like in cancer drugs, for example, um, when they realized that uh, how cancer and the genetic makeup of the cancer um, is allowed to flourish, there's two different schools of thought with cancer. That, For example, there is uh, the metabolic school of thought and the genetic school of thought. And I, I am very interested in both. I don't, I'm not going to be dogmatic about one being correct or the other being incorrect, but... But like with us, the drug called Temidar, which is a glioblastoma drug for brain tumors, they knew that these this drug was a gene-targeted drug. So they intentionally recruited clinical trial participants that they knew had the genetic disposition within their based on their biopsies that this drug would affect them. And so, of course, what happened? They put the clinical trial together. It had good results, which really only means an extra three weeks of life, three months of life. There's no cure in the trials. But then they now just give it to everybody that comes down the pipe with brain tumors. And that's another example. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. And tell me if I'm correct about this, um, because I've met others. Please correct me if I'm incorrect. You started out in pharma. Did you get sort of... Um, did you become just sort of, I don't know, unhappy with the way it's run and then kind of become and go into the sort of mushroom side to like support the supplemental industry? Like how did that sort of transition work for you? Well, actually, I was a mechanical engineer. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, some, some people have certain talents, like they're musicians or they're artists, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I, my talent was always engineering. Okay. And being young and lazy, I was fascinated <laughs> by medicine, you know. Yeah. yeah. But... Uh, being young and lazy, it was easy to do what was easy, which was engineering. And so I designed and built machinery for too many years and kind of worked my way up the ladder until eventually I was uh, working on uh, equipment on nuclear submarines for the Navy. Wow. Okay. And, and in the background, what I'd been doing for, I don't know, 20 years at that point, maybe longer, I'd been growing mushrooms as a hobby, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and every day I was going to Pearl Harbor and I was going down in the sub and I'd walk past this door that said nuclear weapons department. Mm -hmm. And every day I'd stop and I'd look at that door and I'd think, what am I doing with my talent? What the hell am I doing supporting this kind of madness? Right. You know, and I went home and said to my girlfriend one day, I just, I'm tired of it. I can't do that anymore. I don't want to 
support such such horrible things. Mm-hmm. She said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to grow mushrooms. <laughs> she said, well, put your money where your mouth is. It was too late then, so I had to start growing it. Right, right. So, so I started a little mushroom farm, and I was growing mushrooms, and I was in Washington State at a mycologist's uh, workshop, mm-hmm. and he handed me a test tube, and he said, this culture has the cure of cancer. He said, I don't have enough years in my life to research everything I want to research. Mm-hmm. I'm giving this one to you. Okay. And I thought, holy cow. So I started looking into the medicinal uses of mushrooms mm-hmm. and became fascinated. So I jumped on air, went to China, and I worked with the universities and some real top people over there where they've been using mushrooms medicinally for a long time and uh, realized that this is a whole different branch of medicine that we had not been looking at in the West. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up starting that company, Aloha Medicinals. And my particular specialty turned out to be a a real weird mushroom that most people have never heard of. It's called Cordyceps sinensis. And it only grows out of the head of a caterpillar above 14,000 feet in the Himalayas. Hmm. So once I heard about that one, I got on a plane to Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> wow, and, okay. And I uh, did a, took an expedition out into the field, and we figured out how to grow cordyceps. And uh, that's the basis of the HIV medicine that we uh, use in Africa. Wow, that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, because, you know, cordyceps is, uh, is incorrectly thought of as a parasite that kills the insect. And that's just totally not correct. Rather, it's essentially a blood cell. So if we look at blood cells, at one point in our evolutionary past, red blood cells were parasites. And then eventually they became uh, symbiotic Mm -hmm. because parasites kill their host. Mm -hmm. And eventually they became obligate symbionts. We know that from the DNA studies. We can't raise a human or the red blood cells separate from each other. right? Mm -hmm. Well, Insects have not yet evolved red blood cells. Rather, what they have is a single-celled yeast-like organism that performs all the functions Mm -hmm. of a red blood cell. Now, think about a cockroach for a moment. Where a cockroach lives and what a cockroach eats, and yet they're completely immune to all known viruses, Mm -hmm. right? Why? They shouldn't be. They should be affected by viruses like any other living cell, right? Well, it turns out that the cordyceps symbiont Any symbiotic relationship benefits both parties, right? Mm -hmm. The cordyceps produces these natural, non-toxic, antiviral compounds to protect the cockroach against the threats that it finds in its environment. And these antiviral compounds are like any other biologically active compound. You know, look at penicillin. You put it in a horse, a dog, a cat, a human. Mechanism of action is the same, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with these antiviral compounds are effective against hepatitis, colds, and flus, and HIV, and who knows, probably all kinds of different viruses that we haven't even tested or looked at yet. And so this is the basis of HIV therapy in Africa today. Until we found a way to grow it in quantity in the lab in a controlled setting so that it was affordable, because the wild cordyceps is, you know, quarter million dollars a kilo. It doesn't matter how well it works, it's too expensive, right? Well, we got it down to where it's you know, 10 bucks a kilo by doing it in a laboratory, but we still grow it. It's still a natural product. But like I mentioned before, it's not altered in any way so that it's the least toxic form of the molecule. The truth is that we are not very good synthetic chemists, okay? <laughs> this, this, this tree outside of my window here produces things every day that we can't imagine making in a test tube. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at chlorophyll. Every green plant on the planet has chlorophyll. Yep. We don't know how to make chlorophyll. If you want chlorophyll, you got to go to a tree. Yep. So the, the class of drugs called uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, those are a very common class of drugs used in the West for treating HIV and other viral infections. These are copied after the ones that naturally occur in the mushrooms, but we're not good enough chemists to be able to actually make the same thing. We get it close, you know, but toxic. That's fascinating work, John. Good for you. That's fantastic. When I was, 
when I was first looking into HIV in Africa, it was real interesting what I found. The problem why HIV is such a huge problem in Africa is because you can't give a bottle of medicine to an African and say, take this back to your village and use it like I'm instructing you. Right. Because they'll sell it or they'll save it for their uncle who's sicker. Or the worst thing is they'll want to have a good weekend so they won't take them all week and then they'll take a handful on Friday. Mm. And the current class of drugs from the West are too toxic for that. Mm -hmm. If you take a handful on Friday, you die. Whereas you take the natural version of that, which is just as effective, same mechanism of action, take as many as you want mm -hmm. won't even make you nauseous you know right so we have a long ways to go in medicine but there are advances like that you know i didn't ever think it should have been up to me to change the medical field but that's well, what we i didn't expect i didn't expect to be making uh, documentary films about the medical field for the last decade either it's funny yeah, speaking of AIDS, going back to uh, fetal stem cells for a minute, um, I have met one patient um, who was really kind of at death's door with AIDS, and the fetal stem cells pushed him back into sort of the you know HIV status. Um, I haven't talked to him in a while, but but his his white what are, oh gosh, I'm so rusty on this. It was um, what is the the blood cell count that separates you from HIV to AIDS? What is that? Um, CD CD four. Yeah, the CD four count, right? Uh, the CD4 count was way down in like in the teens. He was like in a, it was hideous. Yeah. yeah and he bounced bad. up. He wasn't completely out of the woods, but he bounced up to the 200s, which is still pretty good. Yeah. I think, is it, what is it, over 500 you have to be to be safe out of the AIDS yes. category? But yeah, yeah no, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah, that's right. It's all coming back to me. But what's interesting about AIDS, just to kind of change the subject, and HIV with fetal stem cells. Now, this is really a theory and it's really a long shot, but have you ever heard of the, um, the Berlin patient? The Berlin patient was a guy uh, from San Francisco, actually, who had leukemia and AIDS. And a doctor in Berlin found a bone marrow transplant for this AIDS patient that happened to also be carrying the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. You ever heard of this? Okay. <laughs> okay. This is sort of like the other end of the AIDS. You're doing on the ground, helping people, um, you know, maintain the disease. This is a potential cure uh, that we're using really creative, clever scientific tactics, but two different animals. But basically, you know, the CCR people, there's like a small percentage of the Caucasian race. For some reason, they've only found it in the Caucasian race where there's a, a mutation called CCR5 Delta 32. And if you have that, you are immune to the HIV virus, all right? So this guy, this doctor, because this, this poor guy from San Francisco had AIDS and leukemia, needed a bone marrow transplant to deal with the leukemia. And um, so the Berlin doctor said, okay, not only did I find a match, but it also has the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. Let's see what happens, right? <laughs> and sure enough, it cured his leukemia and uh, HIV has been undetectable ever since. Oh, that's yeah. just fantastic. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. And it's happened one more time in the last year. So there's two people on earth who have been cured of AIDS with this method. But of course, bone marrow transplant is highly uh, dangerous. Many people don't survive it. Um, so yeah. to be able to find a bone marrow match, A, and then B, be able to sacrifice that match with the CCR5 mutation, you know, because you can't replicate it. It's just like, okay, here we go. One shot. It's kind of like scratching off a lottery ticket, you know? But anyway, what I'm getting at is, you know, um, I've kind of like casually talked to M cell and we know it's two different animals. I said, you know, you get all this fetal material. Why don't you say if you can find the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, see what happens. I mean, why not if you find yeah. it? I mean, it's not the same as a bone marrow transplant. You're not replacing the bone marrow, but it would be interesting yeah. to see if they were injected just like they were in you and me uh, into AIDS patients to see how it re would, I mean, maybe it would at least slow it down dramatically. Because I know that the cells do replicate to a, a really huge degree. By the way, you saw my lecture, right? Yeah. Okay, so remember in the lecture, this goes to what I'm saying, that talked about my telomere length? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and again, it doesn't mean my... Yeah, I got my latest ones from my April trip. I'm going to share that with you. Actually, the first time you're sharing this in, with, you know, kind of publicly. But again, it doesn't mean my telomere length grew. And this kind of goes back to the age thing I'm talking about because it shows that their cells grow and multiply inside of you long after injection. You know, you see these small vials, uh, needles, and then they just become these multifamily <laughs> inside of you. So I started out with a 5.5. Uh, KB telomere length in 2017. One year later, it jumped from 5.38 to 7.23. And then in April, before my therapy, it jumped up to, from 7.23 to 8.71. So from oh. 2017 to 2019, I went from 5.38 to 8.71. 
That's significant. Oh, yeah. I know. And it, it, again, yeah. it doesn't mean that mine grew. The most likely hypothesis is that either, no matter what the hypothesis is, it's still exciting. So it, what most likely is these cells are just re re multiplying to such a degree. And since they're brand new, full length fetal yeah. It's, uh, you know, stem cells that they're basically affecting my average length, which is crazy. Yeah, exactly. you know? It's just crazy. So, uh, and I'm, length, but I wonder, I wonder if it is possible for them to grow. I mean, yeah. average length it makes more sense, but hmm, I it, don't think we know enough to. No, we don't. And they don't make a call on that one. They'll be the first to admit all they can do is measure the average length using um, um, a fish mm -hmm. flow or flow fish yeah. uh, method. Uh, which measures them at the white blood cell level. And um, like the, all these commercial telomere places don't have this kind of technology. And I've actually compared them and they're all over the place. There's no consistency to them. But anyway, I don't know. Good question. But I guess it goes back to this whole theory about the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. Like if it behaved the same, maybe it would slow it down. But I'm, I'm getting off yeah. track here. But yeah. I did a really fascinating research project on telomere length a couple of years ago for a company out of Reno okay. who, produ who produces a particular drug which uh, supposedly mm -hmm. causes the lengthening of the telomeres. Mm -hmm. Where I got involved in it is they, they gave me a bunch of this drug and had me put it into the substrate and then grow different types of mushrooms with that. Hmm. hoping that the mushrooms would reproduce this and that they'd be able to use that as a manufacturing method, which mm -hmm. we use on some other kind of drugs. Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't work, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it was an interesting concept. <clears throat> you know what's also interesting um, on that? Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a big business in supplements to make your telomeres grow. <clears throat> and yeah. I've talked to the lead scientists at MCEL about this at great length because I'm just fascinated by my own telomere changes. And they yeah. were saying that I'm gonna try to get this accurate, but they were saying basically that they don't believe that taking supplements to make the telomeres grow is necessarily a good thing. It might look great and you can brag about it, but the reality is um, cancer, for example, cancer stem cells are full length telomeres. <laughs> And your body has an ability, yeah, and your body has an ability to fight that on a, in a natural way every single day, every hour. But if you're basically saying, hey, cancer cells, here, uh, help, let's grow your telomeres stronger, <laughs> you know what I mean? With a synthetic, <laughs> with a synthetic chemical, you know, again, going back to synthetic chemicals that to force telomere length, just so you can brag about it, um, you know, it's not a good thing. It's just something that for the listeners and just for your own knowledge. I have, I don't know enough about it, but that kind of took me aback when she was explaining yeah. this to me that this is, you know, what we're doing, you know, wasn't our goal to make a telomeres grow. We just wanted to devise a test to prove the cells remain in you. This telomere yeah. results is just a happy side effect of that. So it's interesting. So. Well, you know, Eric, I've been working with medical profession now for a whole lot of years, and my takeaway uh, impression from M Cell Clinic was those are some of the best doctors in the world that I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pretty sharp. I'll tell you what. And it's good because you had in that field. You had Vladimir there who spoke their language, even though they speak Ukrainian yeah. and Russian. So you almost had like probably the biggest upper hand of any patient going in there to really yeah. kind of have some oversight. Yeah. Tell me more about the experience you feel by being there. And of course, what Vladimir said by walking in there. Well, it's certainly personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt like that was the best medical treatment that I'd ever been exposed to. Mm -hmm. Uh, not at one point did I feel like they were cutting corners or in a hurry or, you know, mm -hmm. everybody was completely professional, ready and willing to answer any question that I had. Mm -hmm. Between me and Vladimir, we had some, you know, fairly technical questions mm -hmm. that we were asking. And uh, they did the facial treatment on me mm -hmm. with the chorion cells and another type of cell too, I forget which one. But, uh, man... Does that ever make a difference? I've had some kind of, I don't know what you call it, some dermatitis on my face for yep. the last few years. And boy, I was gone in a day. Yep. You know? Yep. It's just fine now. It's not come back yet. Yeah, so. no, that's great. That's great. I mean, the skin being our largest organ, it's one of the first things yeah. to notice. Like, I've had chronic dandruff since I was a kid. And even though I'm not getting the chorion cells on my scalp, but that's one of the first things that went away and remains away. About about nine to 11 months later, it'll start creeping back, the dandruff will. And I'm sitting here now, I just, it's funny that I forgot all about it again. It just goes away again. It's gone. <laughs> like, you know, just, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They had said that somewhere between eight months and a year, uh, 
that often the effects start to drop off. And so mm-hmm. my plan right now is around the end of the year, maybe in January, December, okay. January, I'd like to go back and get a reboost. Okay, great. Hopefully, you know, I don't know if this is a permanent fix or what, but sure feel good now. Yeah, no, I mean, to be honest, like everybody's different, but I just, just being realistic because again, because we're, it's a regenerative medicine. We are degenerating every day. I think I may have mentioned that yeah. earlier, as you already know, it's just one of those things. It's just like, okay, if you can afford it, you know, to make this sort of annual ish thing, you just keep this push back and enjoy your life, you know? Uh, and that's the same with a lot of the degenerative neurological issues and people with like say rheumatoid arthritis is an easy one. For example, that's a highly inflammatory issue that it won't yeah. cure it permanently. It just, it can't, it's just biologically doesn't work that way. You can't just knock it out forever when you have this something that is degenerative that comes with age. Um, but you go every year, you'll pretty much live without rheumatoid arthritis, you know, for the most part. So that's like an example. So, yeah. Yeah. So far, everybody I've talked to has had positive results. I know not everybody does, but I think that the majority of people have positive results. And I think also their approach with using multiple cell types, yeah. even, if, even if it doesn't necessarily cure what you went in there for, mm-hmm. you're going to have a lot of other benefits. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, like, what, did you expect a libido? Did I tell you about that? Or did you, as you watch my lecture, but um, like that's... Like, I think I... I think I I think you mentioned that in the God cell. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Well, like I, the reason I keep mentioning it is no one told me. And that was yeah. one of the first things I noticed. I was like, oh my God, I'm a college kid again. What's going on? Like it was actually yeah. kind of distracting, to be honest. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I know. I know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, give me, I'm curious to know if you can remember, what was like one of the most technical questions Vladimir asked at the clinic when you were in there that you had answered? I don't know. He was speaking Russian. Okay, fine. All right. Okay, there we go. Russian is a little rusty. <laughs> well, so I guess, but he was satisfied with whatever their answer he, was. Yeah, yeah. He had. I think he was having some long discussions about the uh, inner ear. Uh uh-huh. His son was okay. his main focus. Yeah, I'll tell you. For me, um, inner ear. It, there's a lot of different reasons for hearing issues. Like I, being uh, kind of a kid of uh, the '80s and rock and roll, and being to yeah. winning too many rock concerts and living in Manhattan with screeching subways for 13 years and all of that. I blew out my right ear for the most part one day in the studio oh. working on a television commercial years ago. And, um, with these uh, just too many hours of too much volume. And so I have yeah. all the treble and mid ranges are gone, but my base is there. Uh-huh. I probably could use a hearing aid, but what I'm getting at is the cells did not help that at all. It was no yeah. difference. I have a little bit of tinnitus, but it doesn't mean that's my case. Like I basically sped up what would normally be old man hearing loss in like an afternoon you know, or the first portion of my life, basically. Um, yeah. What I'm getting at is, but I have heard of other people with hearing issues for other reasons that weren't related to audio damage specifically that have had improvement. So I guess I just want to throw that out there. Um, you know, I would be interested to see, because that's one of the things I was wondering about, but it did nothing for that. Um, because those are those tiny little, in my case, it's those tiny little bones that pick up the vibrations that yeah. have been broken because of too much noise, you know, on my right side. So, yeah. Apparently, apparently Vladimir's son's problem is that he's, uh, was born without one of those bones. Ooh. Okay. Wow. I forget the name of he told me, but I don't remember. Hmm. But, uh, there's, there is an option to implant some piece of plastic in there. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, that's a, a one-time deal, and if it doesn't work, there's no other options. Right. So he's looking for any other option. Sure. It's funny, he's, he's, he's a surgeon who recommends against surgery in every case. Right, right. <laughs> you know, it's like he, that, he's just adamant about that. Yeah, yeah. No surgery is ever good. Don't do it if there's any way to avoid it. Yeah. Mm, that's what the guy does for a living. So. Yeah, no, he would know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he knows a lot more about surgery than I do, that's for sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I haven't spoken with him in the last month, but I'm curious whether he's going to uh, take it any further and see about getting his son some treatment there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's worth a shot. Again, like, if worst case, spend yeah. the money, nothing happens. You know, there, if, I don't know if he has any other health issues, but it's certainly not going to make his life less, uh, you know, fun to live, that's for yeah. sure, you know. So, well, yeah. For sure. Um. Yeah, because I'm, as you probably know, I'm continuing to kind of casually work on a sequel, partially focused on male infertility, also yeah. following the opening of the new clinic where they're going to offer a lot of new services um, with uh, like 
like for there's a new treatment for type one diabetes that could change the face of that. Um, there's a possibility. So yeah. We're using insulin producing pancreas cells, uh, in, uh, injected using a very safe laparoscopic surgery. Um, so injected or, into the pancreas. Yeah. Well, kind of in between the pancreas and the liver, they were explaining to me, I'm not a surgeon, but they were kind of uh -huh. explaining this to me. That's going to be in the new clinic. They might be doing epidurals, uh, with the neuronal cells for people with Parkinson's and MS, for example, to start out which would send it really? right into the spinal fluid. Yep. Yep. Cause you need, uh, right now that clinic's outpatient and the new clinic will be more of a hospital setting where you can have people staying for multiple days. Cause you don't want to send someone home after an epidural, yeah. you know? Um, yeah. there's also, I actually had, yeah, did you, gone for that. well, you have, I mean, that's, that's down, that's in the pipeline, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. by this time next year, that will be fully available. It might, they're starting to maybe, I know one Parkinson's patient I'm following from Southern California. He might be one of the first ones to uh, do the epidural. They, they're trying to get him in and get everything set up by the end of this year. Of course, he wants it done like tomorrow, you know, so, yeah, but they yeah. don't, you know, they're not ready for that. Um, did you by chance see an eye doctor at the clinic? No. Okay. Not. Yeah, I guess it depends on if you complain about your eyes or not. I've always been a bad nearsighted and of course getting older. I'm living through uh -huh. the age where I'm holding my phone away from my face, the end of my arm to see things, you know? So yeah. they looked at my eye. They have an ophthalmologist on staff there. Um, and I actually had, I was one of the first people to get fetal eye injections when I was there in April. Really? <laughs> yes. This was in surreal this experience. Last April. Yes. When you were, when you saw me there. Yes, that's correct. So they looked at my wife and I were both treated. So they looked at my wife and they go, ah, oh, your eyes are fine. They said, you know, go on. And, uh, they looked at me and they go, Ooh, you know, you could probably use some fetal eye injection. <laughs> I was like, you must be kidding me. Sure, why not? I mean, after all, I made the film. I can't be afraid of this, right? You know, so, and they explained to me, you know, too, that this is a rare because there's only two eyes per fetus. This is not easy to harvest, you know, and versus say the liver cells and the lung cells and et cetera, a yeah. little more, you get a little more mileage out of them. So anyway, um, but it wasn't in the eyeball, but they're going to do this in the new clinic. So, but let me tell you what happened. I videotaped it. I'll be releasing this. They made you me sit in a chair and I leaned my head against the wall so I wouldn't move my head. And they had a very large needle um, filled with these fetal eye cells mixed with whatever growth factors as well, directed yeah. into the eye socket underneath the eyeball. Okay. And it, really? yeah. And it filled up my whole eye socket. Like I had just been hit in the face with a bat. I mean, or I've been crying for a month, you know? And so both eyes. So I, I really, I looked. You didn't, you didn't flinch. Right? No, I did not flinch. <laughs> <laughs> I did not flinch. Okay. It was quite something. So, um, what I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, yeah, then so for like a good four hours, I felt like I had been crying for like a month. I got that kind of crying headache, you know, if you're familiar yeah. with. And um, anyway, but I, I can't really tell. I need to go to the eye doctor. I definitely see clearer, but I almost feel like they changed my prescription, I swear, because I think I need to go to the eye doctor. I think it altered it, um, maybe in a good way. I will find out. I'm in the middle of finding and figuring right. this out. That'll be interesting. Yeah, it will be. Um, and I'll report back later about this because I got it all on tape and everything. But what I'm getting at is, though, they're going to graduate from using doing it in the eye socket, which is still is pretty darn close. It, you know, the eye takes in lots of blood, you know, but they're going to start yeah. injecting this using an ophthalmolo ophthalmologist um, into the eyeball once in the new clinic is happening for people specifically with macular degeneration. So that's something else that they're doing that I, oh. yeah. So anyway, what I'm getting at is I'm going back again in September and I'm going back again, probably again one more time before the year is up. Just what I'm saying is stay in touch with me. We might be there at the same yeah. time or I can try to make it happen. My trip to be the same as yours. Cause I definitely want to stay in touch with you, you know, for all the obvious reasons. Um, you're a great guy, but I also want to follow your story as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. I might, so. I might very well be ready to go by September. I don't know. We'll just have to see. Okay, sure. Yeah. If they all accept you, why not? Um, I know they don't want to, yeah treat people too soon, but depending on the patient, um, you know, and, and the reasons, you know, they will uh, move it up. So, yeah. 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 They're reasonable in their approach for sure. Yeah. They're it's also a, somewhat conservative, I think in their approach. They are. It's a weird, just jump into it. Yeah. It's a, it's a kind of a delicate dance because they don't want to seem like salesmen when they say, Hey, you might need to come back in nine to 12 months. They're not trying to rope you in. It's just the reality. Yeah. If you really want to maintain yeah. this, these new, uh, improvements. So, yeah. Oh, I never, I never felt at all like they were the salesmen. That's great. Uh, very professional. Yeah. Have Have you stayed in touch with any of the other patients that were there with you the same week? No. Okay. Well, like you mentioned, you know, I wasn't really uh, walking too well mm -hmm. the first couple of days there, so I didn't really get to meet anybody except just at breakfast there. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Yeah. There's a couple of interesting people for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Timothy, I hope that he got his relief he was looking for. Sound yeah. Like he'd been through quite the cycle as well. Yeah, I need to get in touch with him as well. He lives in uh, Las Vegas, actually. Yeah, because I know he tried a few different stem cell clinics in the States and mm-hmm. said he had limited success. I mm-hmm. think he mentioned somewhere in Florida. Yeah. He did get some success, but sounded like it was uh, pretty drastic. He said 100 and something, 175 injections or something. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I just hope he... I hope it worked for him as well. Me too. Uh, me too. He's a good guy. I'm going to get in touch with yeah. him. Yeah. Well, John, um, we've been talking a good hour or so, yeah, a little more than an hour. Anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? No, that pretty much covers it, okay. I think. But uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. You My know, pleasure. Again, I really appreciate that uh, you took the time to make that documentary because I think you've affected a lot of people's lives. certainly affected mine in a positive way, so I appreciate that. That's really great to hear, John. It's really a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and drama went into making it, and uh, it's that's that's, yeah. why, that's why I do it, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Give All right, John. Give my regards to your wife. I will. Thank you. I will. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thanks. Sure. Bye. Bye. For the sequel to The God Cells, I am actively looking for men who are currently trying to conceive that are deemed completely infertile. If you are a candidate or know someone who is, who would also like to give this therapy a try, I would love to document you for my upcoming sequel. Email me at eric at ericmarola.com. Go to stemcellsmovie.com and sign up to the mailing list. And don't be shy. If you heard this podcast or you watched my documentary, The God Cells, and you're thinking about going to M-Cell to get this therapy yourself, email me, eric at ericmarola.com. Just like John Holiday, I have no issues talking to anyone that sees my film and wants to ask me some questions. See you next time in episode five of The God Cells podcast. I'm Eric Marola, and thank you for listening.